Welcome to the Keen on Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Keenan Yoga podcast is Pretzi Raisinam. Pretzi is well known for authoring the tradition of Batabi Joyce, Ashtanga Yoga, in 2005 on the primary series, and in 2007, Nadi Shodhana, the intermediate series book. They're beautiful books and create a unique uh, wealth of information. He started practicing in 1989, introduced to the series by Derek Island, teaching in 91. In 1997, he co-opened the Ashtanga Yoga School of Helsinki, an incredible popular school for Ashtanga Yoga. Previous to this and during, along with his teaching, he's a Finnish folk healer, so he's well-renowned also for his legendary energetic adjustments. Welcome to the Keenan Yoga Podcast, Petri. Thank you so much, Adam. It's great to have you. Um, can you just tell us a bit about how you start, first started yoga, how you got into it? Okay, let's start. Um, okay, we have to go back about 32 years to the end of the 80s. and um, 30, 33 years? To 32, 33 <laughs> years, yeah. <laughs> so how old did you start yoga at? What age, what age did you start? Well, I was about 21 when I started Hatha Yoga. Mm-hmm. First time, um, but it was maybe a little bit longer story. What all brought me back to yoga was uh, I became vegetarian when I was fifteen. Uh, I got interested about the uh, yoga philosophy and also religions. I, I come from the atheist family, so I didn't have any kind of religious education. Right. So. When I started to kind of started to think with my own brain, when you're like teenager and yeah. start to read about books and get interested about stuff, uh, I started to read uh, about religion and philosophy, and I met some people who <laughs> funny thing they I had some friends who went to Steiner or Waldorf School. Yeah, and and they learned, uh, I would say, a different view about life than atheist view. But and you, you, have, grew up, you, you grew up in Finland, right? Yeah, I, I grew up so in, quite, in it's, Helsinki. It's, right, so it's quite right, kind of it's quite normal to have that kind of uh, philosophy towards life, isn't it? Like, a, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, yeah. We have um, well. Most of the Finns are Protestants or we are Lutherans. Right. But I think that it's only about 60% nowadays, so 65%. And then there is 30% of non-religion. So they can be beliefs about things, but they are not Christians anymore. But right. they, have, they have some ideas. Right. And then there's few Muslims and a few Hindus and... Oh, yeah, right. But there is a there's quite a big percent of uh, these people who are not part of the the religion. Okay, and they're practicing a religion, but they're not actually part of it, like part yeah, of the right? Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, maybe somebody could call them new age, new okay, age people, right. or like they have some they have some beliefs, but right, they're, right, right. They are not members of the church. Okay. I was, I was just wondering whether it got into your kind of folkloric interests, which you're famed for. Uh, but, you know, well, it's in the kind of an aside, and we'll cover that later. So just carry on with the story about how you got into, how you got into yoga and yeah. how you got into Ashtanga. So slowly, um, I was reading uh, Yoga Sutras, and there was a few things which really uh, got me interested about, um, about yoga. Was One was the... 
from the third chapter, there's the Sutra 42, which was talking about all this, like how you can train the mind and um, what will happen when you focus for different things. Right. With a, like a deep concentration and really get into those. And uh, so 42 is about the con- connecting with the space. Uh, and really getting as light as you become light as a, as a piece of cotton and you can kind of levitate in the air. That was one. And the second one was from the second chapter, uh, the 16th Sutra, which uh, talks about the, that we can... Um, We can, uh, it's about the, the pain, uh, which would be in the future if you don't do anything, I would say. Okay, right, right. Yeah, so, um, so we can avoid the pain from the future. Yeah. That kind, yeah, of, the- that kind of idea, I, I, I could see that, you know, my friends who, well, I was still young, but I could see that if you don't do anything, and I was even on that path of, you know, playing in the bands and drinking too much alcohol and all, I could see that this is not the good path. So if I right. keep, keep going like this, it's, I will be like, you know, I will die soon or, you know, be, be in a really bad condition. And you talk about that, the, the sutra, hey, I'm do come anagatam. I think that pain exactly. is, is avoidable. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you all now I can see that like, you were feeling a suffering then. You, you, you know, you, you had that I, feeling. In your... I was not maybe feeling suffering, but I could see that I, I was going to that direction. You were going to. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same feeling at university. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, love, but you had to the kind of honesty, and now now I can see that. Yeah, it it, it was really true that. Right. It, it works. Yeah. And so I went to the Hatha yoga class when I was 21. And uh, well, it was that kind of finished Hatha yoga. We have the Hatha yoga association in Finland. And it, in the 1970s, they used to do very like Indian type of, actually Desi Kacha was their guru, right. uh, Chris Mathur's son. And they did quite Indian practice, but they started to change more and more they started to take out the Indian names from the asanas and it started to become more and more like a Christian yoga style. Right. And then when Ashtanga came to Finland in 88, it brought back the Indian kind of influence, the Indian style and uh, mantras and asana names. And who, who brought it to Finland? Derek Island. Oh, really? He came to Finland, did he? <laughs> yeah. But from uh, from you going to Crete or you, you no, no 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 there was a Finnish lady called Tube Palm Train and she met Derek and Rana. Okay. Yeah, I know I know Tube. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you were you were at a practice place, right? Yeah, I was so, practicing with her. You practiced yeah. with her, or you went to Crete? I I practiced first, so I started Ashtanga with her. But then the same fall when I started, Derek came and Derek came and. And they were they were very powerful people at that time. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. they, they looked good and they they had they were nice and uh, charismatic and all. So then I went to Chris. I went to Chris right. after that, and uh, I really got into Ashtanga through Derek. I, I would say more Derek than Radha. Radha was taking care of the beginners. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Derek was with the. I think it's so funny because they got so many people into it, but yet, you know, these days in the Ashtanga scene, no one really knows of them, you know, which is a shame. And I'm trying to pin Rada down for an interview, but she's quite enigmatic, you know. Obviously, we can't interview Derek anymore, who would surely give an interview quite willingly. Um, yeah, 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 there were some uh, bad experiences for her. And also, Derek died already in 1997, so the new Ashtanga is... Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't really so you, know. You were introduced there for, from Tuve, who, who, as I remember, you know, from, from Crete, in fact, I know Tuve, 
um, which is funny. Um, and then Lino got involved, is it? Lino was then your next teacher after that? Exactly. Lino came in 1994 okay. to Finland and uh, he really brought that, well, he wrote the first book of Ashtanga, that Ashtanga Yoga, which was the first book. Of course, Patavi Church did the first one already in uh, 1958, 1960, but it was not translated into English. So Lino did the first book in 94, and it had the vinyasa system. So we really started to really get into the vinyasa system and uh, that like a correct method. <laughs> I can imagine you know, that, yeah, that, that would have probably been taken up in the kind of uh, Finnish mentality that, that you know. That yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, and, uh, yeah. So we, we like the rules here. And, yeah, I and, could imagine so, yeah. yeah. And we went to Mysore in 96. People could see that, okay, these are the Finnish people who knows the vinyasa. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it by heart by that time. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, we kind of, it is true, you know, the, we have in Finland, we have this, when we start to do something, we, 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 we start to do it. And we, like, uh, people think like, why this Finland became so big with Ashtanga? But I think it was very natural that when people start something, they, they keep doing it. And I think also I often feel like, you know, I taught in Vancouver for many years and we, you know, we had a good weather over there. We had, you know, a lot for a lot of the year. You had the mountains, the sea, you had a lot of outdoor sports and activities you could do. But in colder countries where you have to be inside a lot of the year, it lends itself, right, to like committing to a you know, practice which you can do inside, you know. And you haven't got so many opportunities. Or Southern Mediterranean where you can just go out at night and have tap <laughs> and a few guns. So, yeah. And the Finnish mentality is, uh, is kind of fits well with Ashtanga because yeah. we have a very strong sauna culture. So people go to sauna two times a week, three times. Some people go every evening or every oh, day. they like sweating. They like so they're sweating, sweating, yeah. they're sweating uh, relaxing through the sweating and the hot... Yeah. Uh, Okay. Because, you know, we have a long winter also. Uh, the other thing is we are kind of quiet culture. Mm-hmm. All don't, people like to be quiet. They can be quiet for long times, even among the people. I, think, I, people. I, I, I remember. It can be that people can sit down, like 10 people, and nobody says anything. And it's just natural. And I think that was one of your introductions at Purple Valley when you introduced yourself at a workshop. I think my wife told me you said say something like, "I'm not unfriendly. I'm just Finnish." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, paraphrasing or something along those lines. You know, like it's just a quite yeah. the culture, right? Yeah, yeah. It is. So what, what is in a what is in a yoga shala? In uh, you know, people work hard, they sweat, and they can be quiet. So that's all. That's all what we want. Mm, right. <laughs> Sweating, hard work, and, and a piece of quiet. Yeah, and then being among people, but, but you have the possibility not to talk. And <laughs> well, it's not that, talking, that's so problematic. It's not, the, it's not even <laughs> expected that you talk. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want to talk, or, you know. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, I had a sport, I, I used to play ice hockey, so I had that kind of heavy training background. Okay. Training six times a week was, was normal. I, I did it already since I was six. And uh, so that part was good. And I, I really liked that physical part, but I, I was looking more for the, for the mental side of yoga. The physical was kind of surprised. And I really liked to stretch my body because I was very stiff. But I was really looking for the for the peace of mind and uh and i was still i was still thinking about those supernatural powers <laughs> what you could <laughs> what you could find from the yoga sutras i think um, that's how a lot of people got into it you know yeah. that, that interest i think me too but more for me the carlos castaneda books you know those uh, books of, was, uh, yeah was, tales of power and the you know the native yeah, american exactly. yeah i was, I was, I was also into those yeah <laughs> realm, but I, I couldn't find the yoga sutras. I didn't find those. To, you know, they were they weren't in ethics in uh, outside London at the time. I didn't. Yeah, find there, yoga, was all, yoga there was also one book from uh, Rudolf Steiner where he gave uh, different exercises or 
this uh, test, like how you how you train your to become more sensitive with the nature and to experience the aura of different things that you. I, I I was doing those tests and I put different things on the to the nature and I can try to kind of have connection with those. They were physical objects like stone and piece of tree and things like that. And then you try to kind of realize the difference in those, kind of how they vibrate right. as different objects. And like, yeah, there was already that, I was doing already before I, I, I started yoga. And I was, of course, also reading Castaneda. Yeah. And also, that, <laughs> that, that was part I'm, of it. I'm going to go back into the, um, you know, the, your, your energy work. But let's just go through your, you know, kind of like your micro trajectory. So, you know, you, you found it with, uh, with Lino in, in Helsinki and then you went to Mysore. Um, and obviously, you know, you had that collaboration with uh, Patabi Joyce and uh, Chirat, uh with their book. Um, so can you tell us, I mean, you must have had a good experience in Mysore. Can you tell us about your early experiences and how you developed or how, how you might reflect upon it now even? Yeah. Um, so I went to Mysore in the end of uh, December in 1996, and we already learned with with, with Lino. Lino was there was this. Uh, it already started in the 1970s with David Williamson, and David Swenson, and all these guys. This uh, like more acrobatic uh, style of Ashtanga, where we used to do lots of handstands and all those things. So we we learned from Lino that. You have to do handstands between the Navasana. You have to do handstands in the Sansa rotations. And we yeah, actually did as well. Oh, the Sansa rotations we did also. And we did actually in the primary series like 40 or 50 handstands. So when we went to Mysore, we, well, it was all, it was quite interesting to meet part of the choice that was maybe a little bit different what I was expecting. He was, uh, he didn't look like he, he was practicing asana anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was, it was a very powerful experience to be in that very small yoga shala where there was uh, 12 people. Yeah. Uh, this sound of the, because that time it was really sound breath. It was not like free breath like nowadays. It was the heavy sound, heavy verb, people sweating hard. What did you think of your handstands? And we did lots of handstands. Oh, so you were doing oh. them then? You, you carried on doing the handstands and the sometimes. Sure. Right, and, right. And he allowed, and he allowed that. And Patabi just like handstands. He, he was into the uh, kind of superhero thing. He liked the muscle arts and he liked those uh, Chinese movies when there's uh, muscle art movies. So he, Patabi Church really liked that people did acrobatics. Right. Which changed completely when Sora took over. Mm, mm. He was not so much into that kind of showing, showing off acrobatics. <laughs> I didn't realize that, that he actually almost encouraged that, right? Yeah. Huh. And so when we did the first uh, handstands in the science rotation, Patabi looked at us and he was like, my students. <laughs> right. He was very proud of us. And uh, this was actually what yeah. I heard from the other students. I, I couldn't see it, but some people said like, wow, we're part of it. So you saw you the first time you know, in the shala and you did the handstands. He was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> but then Anyhow, I you saying in a, another podcast that it hurt your wrists. You had some kind of trouble with the wrists of the handstands. Is that right? Yeah, sure. We, we right. did so much. And, you know, we were on the hands all the time. So I had a, I broke my wrist. Right. That happened already quite early, maybe in 98, which was, I think, quite natural if you think about how much we did the handstands. <laughs> that, I mean, that's really interesting because obviously now it's quite the opposite. If you do a handstand, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll probably be sent out. <laughs> yeah. Well, this handstand thing started already. David Williams called it, uh, um, advanced primary series. So there was primary series and then there was advanced primary series where you 
did all these poses like you just you didn't do it like the normal vinyasa, but you just went up to handstand and straight into the next pose. After the next pose, you went to the handstand and straight into the next pose. So there was already in the seventies it started, and uh, when people went to Mysore, they were allowed to do that. What they called advanced primary series, hmm. and of course this went all to the all the way to the second series. Like after Bakasana, people went up to the handstand. After Bakasana B, there was a handstand. After the all these like Vipara um, Shirsasana and all these poses, there was a handstand. And uh, yeah, so this started to change a lot in the in the end of the nineties mm. when Patanjali okay. started to be older and. Uh, he was uh, part of, uh, Surat, I think, got more influence in the, in the yoga solo. Why do you think it changed? Because your book chronicles the, the newer style then. I mean, I don't remember many handstands in your, your exactly. primary book, right? Exactly. Though. So my books are uh, kind of the document between 2004 and 2007. Right. Mm. And I think it's a, it's a good document, so you can always go back and see how the practice was at that time, because now with Sarat is not exactly the same. What other people teach is not maybe exactly the same anymore. And what it was before 2004, it was not the same. Mm -hmm. so it's a, my books are really the document from, from that, that time. time. It right. was exactly, exactly what Patabu George was teaching, because most of the information just came straight from him, and also from Sarat at that time. I always wondered how you got into the position of doing the book. Did you approach them or how, how, did, it, how did it kind of transpire? Uh, yeah, especially the second book was, was interesting because there was many people who wanted to do the second series book. And uh, I heard from some very influential Ashtanga teachers that they asked if they could do it and they couldn't. They didn't get permission for it. Uh, I don't know exactly why it happened, but uh, in the beginning of 2007, I think it was already in 2006, I asked for Patavi Choice if, if I'm allowed to interview him for and to make the second series book. And he, he said, we can start. Uh, he said that I have to come to the Shala every day at four uh, to interview him. And I did, I did that. I came every morning, or every day at 4 p.m. And 4.30, the registration started, so we had half an hour time. Right. Anyhow, he was almost never there. So <laughs> I went at 4, and he was maybe he was there once a week. One time a week, he, we got interview half an hour, sometimes maybe one hour. But anyhow, we, we went through the second series. We went through lots of things. It must have taken nobody, ages. Nobody, nobody knew right. before. And I was there talking with Hamish. I was talking with other people. Some people knew some things. Some people didn't know. What, what uh, kind of things? Uh, vinyasas, tristes, um, uh, distances between the feet in some poses. And that's the intermediate series book. Yeah, that was especially in the intermediate series. The primary was um, that was easier to make because the information was already out, and there was not so much difference between what I learned before and what I what what he told. But there was uh, lots of difference in the in the intermediate series. Right. So you just approached him for the primary one and he said yes and then you kind of did it and the, for the intermediate one yeah. you were much more you much more worked with him right and all, all the interviews all the interviews I did in the office uh, and I had to show the poses on the floor between the tables and uh, so because there was a it was quite a difficult communication because my English and his English and Sarat was sometimes there sometimes he was not there uh, so many times we had to, I had to demonstrate, okay, this is what I mean. And then he told that, okay, your hand is in the wrong place. Okay. Right. And your knee has to be there. And this is the alignment. And, you know, this is the correct align where you have 
hand and foot has to be in. So it was it was kind of practical introduction for those series. <laughs> and um, with it make it a of what you were doing and what he was instructing. Yeah, there was there was in intermediate series there was. But he hadn't shown you that in the class. He he didn't show so much in the class. It was it was his method sometime. I, I understood that for Patabi choice, the most important thing was that people came to practice. It was not exactly that everyone is in the right alignment and mm. doing the right thing, but the main thing was people came and practiced, and that was That's the spirit. Existed, yeah. That was the spirit. Mm. Maybe yeah, it, also, it still exists today. I think that feeling is still the same in a way. That, you know, yeah. People assume if they do it in front of Shirat says it, you know, that is exactly the way that he wants it. But a lot, you know, I mean, apart from the handstands, obviously, you, you know, you're, you're at, <laughs> definitely not allowed to do them. But, you know, for a lot of it, it's like, well, you know, like, it's not, it's not so strict as people, are, you know, assume that Maestro is, right? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like, ask, I, I, yeah, I went to the question. question. They might answer, but, you know, they don't just tell you the answer. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I went first time to Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Nepal, it was very shocking almost that uh, people were like moving around and, you know, sometimes chanting, sometimes not chanting. Some people were sleeping. Right. And I, I, the most important is that the people are going to the temple and they, they do it. It's there. It's there. Yeah, they are there. Even if, it, even if they're sleeping, they're still there. Yeah, they're still there. <laughs> and... I mean, have you been to Maestro recently? What you know, um, latterly, obviously, you were kind of very. I think you, know, you must have been quite close to Shiraz at the time, and you know, certainly had a unique communication with Batavi Joyce. And um, I, I know that I saw you in Maestro about two thousand seven. Uh, have yeah. you been going back? And what are your feelings now about about the whole system that you chronicled? Mm-hmm. Have you changed your perspective at all? Yeah, I, I went last time in two thousand sixteen, practicing right. Shiraz. Uh-huh. And uh, so between two, uh, between 96 and 2016, I went maybe 16 or 17 times. And there was just one year break <laughs> uh, in 2000. Or maybe it was, sorry, maybe 99, I had one year break. Right. Uh, yeah. Lots of things changed, mm. especially after Guruji was passing in 2009. Uh, uh, I think there's so much to talk. <laughs> 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 well, the first thing was that I have to say that already when we went to Mysore in 96, uh, we knew that we are going to Mysore we are going to the different culture. And we knew that there was uh, some things like uh, with the money that we have to be careful with part of the choice. We knew that the adjustments are hard. So some people told us that how to uh, survive or surrender. Okay. And uh, we could see that there was some un- improper adjustments. Oh, you could, could really? You oh, yeah, sure. You right, right, right. Sure, already, right. already in the beginning. Right. But how do you, I mean, obviously, and, how do you suit your mind to the fact that, well, the adjustments are strong. He, he was, uh, you know, quite careful with the money. And, and, uh, and uh, there was potentially this inappropriate adjustments. What, what we, I mean, you know, not pointing the finger, but it's, it's strange, isn't it? How so, you know, most people somehow just put that to the side at the time. Was that, you know, how, how did that kind of happen? Yeah, I, I think it was, yeah. uh, people wanted to learn the practice. Right, right. We, we could feel the value of the, the sequences and, and this Krishna right. Charya style. Mm-hmm. And questioning something would be really hard. It was also a different time where many things were kind of normalized. Um, you know, a little bit similar as when Lino Miele came to Finland, 
we didn't know who was his girlfriend who because he looked like he had a lot many of them <laughs> and then we <laughs> and then we thought that okay he's Italian but, so yeah so it, Italians That's okay yeah <laughs> Italians behave that way so they have that kind of culture that uh, they can be it's different than what we had okay right so and that when we right went to there. India we had yeah, a similar different kind of rules of, right it was right. something like okay this is India this is not this is not Finland and and um, I think it was quite impo- impossible to talk about those things. The one thing was also that there was many very experienced Ashtangis, also Karen Rain, and all of these people were there, and they didn't say anything. So we were like, we came from this small country. That time, my English was very, very limited. I couldn't really talk, speak English at all. Um, so to say something was uh, it was almost impossible. Right. Mm. So I think that we could see that the practice is amazing. We could we made a progress. We felt amazing. We could we could feel that okay, this is this is real yoga. This is not some new age stuff where people are doing like created yesterday. Uh, we could feel the benefits. Mm. And questioning the benefit, uh, questioning the, the the practice method or the teaching method would be would be really tough. You know, I, I don't know. You, you would be out from the community or out from the yoga shala or <laughs> kicked out, yeah. or you would never go back. Yeah, and this I same this same thing that. already started in the seventies. You know, people realized the the value of the practice, but it was difficult to talk about the. The problems. Yeah, I think that's difficult with any community, isn't it? That you have this sense of peer censorship and no one can speak out for fear of being ostracized, yeah. right? In a way. But I mean, yeah, and, and now it's come to light and, you know, and we're all aware of, aware of, aware of that. And um, what, what are your feelings about the traditional element of the practice? Are you still a traditional teacher? Do you still teach the style the way that you taught it? Do you still believe in the traditional sequencing and the devotion to tradition let's say <laughs> yeah I'm right I mean that was part of it right like right. yeah yeah well I've been doing my own research about the tradition and I'm I'm a little bit sad actually that I feel that some people have misunderstanding about Patabi Choi's position in the tradition mm. and I, I really think that when Patavichor said that he's teaching what he learned, he talked through. It was true. He he really was teaching what he learned. Uh, we can see that already. Uh, we can see how Iyengar was practicing and what he was teaching. And I think it's it's good to, to good to look look a little bit what he was doing instead of looking like what Patavichor was doing. Because what Ayanga learned was the same system. Mm. And he left, he left from Mysore already in 1938. So after 1938, he didn't practice so much with Krishna Chara because he, they met very rarely. And, but his own practice all the way up to 1975, and there's one demonstration where he, it's very clearly that, clear that he's yeah. practicing Ashtanga Yoga. Absolutely. So his own, yeah. pra- his own practice was Ashtanga Yoga. Uh, but he was teaching, he, was, he wasn't teaching Ashtanga Yoga. And why he wasn't teaching Ashtanga Yoga was that because his students were different than the young boys in Mysore in the 1930s. So what Krishmacha was teaching in 1930s were these young Hoysala Brahmins uh, who were like 50 years old or 20 years old was not the same anymore in Pune when Ayanga was there. He had a, mm. people came, you know, doctor recommended, okay, there's this last chance for you, like after doing all the therapies and medicine. And there was this Ayangar, and he started to create the style, what became Ayangar style, you know. I think there's also, there's a lot of wrestlers in Pune, wasn't there? I think he, my experience of a Yengar method was that it, well my understanding of the history of it was that he was formulated around a, like a like a wrestling community 
He they were the wrestlers, and they, I think he got a job. He got his first job that was teaching the wrestlers yoga or something like yeah. that. He was very poor. Um, and then he amended it to teach this wrestling, uh, you know, community there. Yeah, there were the wrestlers and bodybuilders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, people who were really sick. Mm, mm. Right. And so so all, all these people were completely different than this young, skinny, Brahmin boys mm, mm. Who, who could do all these amazing poses and made progress very quickly. Like primary series was not meant to be practiced for 10 years or 20 years. It was, it was maybe one month before they started to do intermediate. And intermediate mm. was maybe only a few months before they started to do the advanced. So I think we have to see the, the history of, of Ashtanga that we can understand and modify the practice according to students. Because nowadays right. we have, our students are similar as Iyengar students. We, are not, we don't have young boys uh, <laughs> who has all the privilege to, you know, time, support. Well, also, I, also I, I think our students are getting older because the, the younger ones seem to go to the music and the vinyasa, <laughs> right? right? Like, so the people that like the Ashtanga are almost like, you know, they were like the, the younger students from before, you know, whereas before it was like, you know, we started, well, you started before me a bit, but, you know, it was like the older people seem to gravitate towards the younger and they slightly younger than the Ashtanga. But now it's like a step further, whereas you've got all the new kind of styles and the younger people go to them. So the Ashtangas, like the dinosaurs, are stuck in the Ashtanga, you know, the older people, right? right. You know, I know. The Yenga, I well, then maybe the Yenga was even older. I don't know. But anyway, yeah. So, yeah, yeah you, so, you know, it bring, it back to, bring it back to the point. You're, you're, you modify the sequence. You're not so, holy. Yeah. Not, so I, yeah. I'm, teaching, I'm teaching exactly what I learned from Pata Choice right. for the people who can do it. Right. This, yeah. this means the like the who has the the body type, the age, uh, possibility to practice. You know, five times a week, six times a week. Then I teach exactly what I learned. So this is the 2004-2007 system. Right. You can teach that one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like what what I have in a book. Yeah. To make so it clear, there's it. not many. I mean, there's not many variations now. That I mean, that, I think the new, no. the, the Sharat's new one. I'm asking him. We showed a few things, right? That were rolled together. I think the Dadakanasana had a different vinyasa count, and you know, a few things. Yeah, the finishing poses are, you yeah, know, has a yeah, little bit different together. vinyasa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some forms are different, but anyway, it's it's like ninety eight yeah. ninety eight percent yeah. the same. Yeah, even yeah. if you go to nineteen seventies, it's it's quite the same. There were a few differences in the in the sequence, and, and um, were they were they happy with the books? By the way, I think so. Yeah, right. I think <laughs> so. Yeah, they, they they never. I don't think they they would say if they would be very happy. That's I think they would the, say if they weren't happy. Yeah, and it was. I mean, I don't know whether I've seen your second your intermediate book, but I remember seeing. It's a funny, it's a full circle because I remember seeing that primary series book on the. On the table, on the dinner table, in, in Crete, in practice place, you know, you're, it's yoga plus now, you, you know, there in Crete, that's where I saw it. And uh, yeah, I was amazing. Oh, that's really nice. It's a beautiful book, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, the, so yeah. I, the second book is, is really, I, I'm really happy about it because it has the pictures, it has all the vinyasas. I had a really good communication with Patabi Choice and I got some, some of these techniques for which you can't find from anywhere else. So it's, it's a really, I think it's a very valuable book for everyone. On, on that note then, how important is the very specific aspects of the technique? Are we, I mean, I've had this conversation with other people in terms of, yeah. are, we, are, we doing something, are we doing something that's highly energetic or as we talked about before, is it more just about a daily discipline and a daily practice or is it something a little bit more subtle than that, you know? Well, I think when you, when you do the right alignment, uh, and the right vinyasa, there's a different benefits for the poses. So there's like poses, like in the second series, I could say like Vatayanasana. Right. Uh, and when I look at people doing Vatayanasana, sometimes I say that there is like, there is nothing correct. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the hands are wrong, the, the leg is wrong, the knee is yeah. wrong. The whole pose is, is so far from the, 
from the okay, yeah. right, right alignment that I don't know yeah, how much good, there's yeah. benefit. I, I don't think there's so much benefits anymore. That's a good so one to pick, actually. Yeah. yeah people what, are what, just, people when just you're talking about get, benefits, are you talking about energetic benefits or structural benefits or both? Uh, um, uh, I think you can't really... Uh, it's always both. Right. Uh, so the physical alignment but, makes the energy. The, you know, I think when you do the right vinyasa, right alignment, there is some kind of strength physically and mentally. There is a strength what you don't get from the kind of the wrong alignment. Right. Um, there is some like power. What you only realize when you do that right, you don't know it before you do it. It's a similar when you follow the vinyasa system and you end all the breath and you end all the vinyasas, there's, this, there's a very different power, which doesn't come if you just do like, like something like close to the vinyasa. Right. Or half, right. half vinyasas that you're just mm. ending the vinyasas between the breath ends or you do something very quickly. Or, mm. So there's a, certain things, it's also effects for the mind state. It makes the mm. mind clear and i would say the, the vinyasa system itself is a is a clear system which is affecting for the mind to build that kind of clarity and uh, well, you, yeah so when you talk about the vinyasa system you're being particular with the counting and the breath place exactly right? exactly right, right okay okay and people who people who start to do the clear vinyasa they they're like wow now i understand before it didn't have the same feeling, and now I feel strong and. But it just strikes me interesting because you're not, you're not. No, I mean, I haven't practiced with you personally, but I know many people have, and they, you know, they love you. Um, and but you, one thing is that they love that your softness. You're not famed for being a very strict teacher. It's not, you know, we don't sort of oh, Petri, he won't let you do this. He's very strict and very particular. You're very inclusive. You're you're kind of very allowing in in the space that I. Yeah, I think, exactly. Right? So you, many times the students who hasn't seen me, they, they're very afraid because they know I have this box and the vinyasa correct, kind of correct method from that time. And yeah, all. right. But then when they see me in a class and yeah, I'm, the whole thing, I think they are stung as a therapy. So you don't go to the psychotherapist or psychiatrist to, to be afraid that you do something wrong. Right. So the same thing when you come to our standard class, you shouldn't be afraid that, like who you, how you look or how is you practice or what are you doing. There should be the safe, safe space where you feel free to be yourself. And do you make you, particular? Do you correct people? Yeah, it's the way how we see if something is, I don't know, if somebody could, change the pose or do something different or you don't really say that something is wrong or you are bad or, or, uh, you know, you, you always go to like, you can try this way or this is how I learned or, you know, you just change how you communicate. Yeah. And yeah, also yeah. You, you also change how you're behaving or how you, you know, how the impressions in your face, you know, you don't look like, uh, um, you are not happy or what they're doing or disappointed or mm. mean or, or you know mm -hmm. you kind of look that everything is fine you just keep doing and this is good that you're coming and everything right. is fine we can just try to do it this way and yeah, yeah. maybe you like and be here and the angle That's kind of, of you know, yeah it's interesting. I mean, obviously, you you taught for. I mean, you taught for a long time. You practiced what thirty years. You taught for maybe at least twenty years, right? Probably. I mean, and it, and it seems to me the way you're communicating that it's more building a, a certain energy or relationship between the student and yourself, maybe than just teaching them the correct vinyasa, right? Yeah. So yeah, we do both. Right. <laughs> right. What about your adjustments? Because you're well known for adjustments, for very particular adjustments, and obviously you have that uh, that uh, folkloric. Um, 
well, how do you call it? But I'm going to say bone setter, but I'm not sure that's quite right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you have a background in folk healing, right? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I have a background to, you know, therapy work, body work. Mm. And, uh, well, I started to teach Ostanga in 91. That's already 29 years. Oh, wow. Well. Um, and in 91, I also started to, I started my own practice. I had this place where I, I did this therapy work for eight years. In 99, Ostanga was so popular that I had to think like, should I stop doing the therapy work and move to that yoga therapy work? And that's what I was doing. Uh, our workshops were so full in Helsinki. We had beginners workshop twice a month and there was almost, oh, every time there was more than 100 people for, the, for five years, all the way to 2004, there was more than 5,000 people did our beginners workshop in Helsinki. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> yeah. yeah, it was amazing how, how big it became. That's my, in my imagination, that's the population of Helsinki. Yeah, it's about it. <laughs> well, it must be five. Must be like five percent. <laughs> I don't know how many people. Yeah, it was. You know, it was amazing. A lot, were, you know, proportion to the population. It's not a huge city, right? So, I mean, there was uh, in two thousand four. There was four members of Finnish Parliament practicing Ashtanga Yoga. Right. I mean, you must have been a celebrity there. You might. You still are. Well, I don't know if people remember me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Ashtanga. It's not anymore like the. Do you the main yoga style, some, right? There's some um, yeah. Finnish influencer that kind of so does the, yoga on the, the side the, that's a lot more famous than you nowadays. Yeah, the, the old people remember me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Joking aside, let's go back to your adjustments and 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 how you uh, adjust because you, I think I remember someone telling me you you talk about moving energy with your adjustments. Well, I think all the people who understand how the energy works, mm. use the energy in the adjustments. Um, and also the people who understand how the energy works, they can use it or not to use. They, or you can use it more or you can use it less. So right. you, can, you can become a healer or you just do a normal kind of adjustment. Uh, so the, I've been talking with some psychiatrists about how they work and um, the progress, the process, how you meet people and how you start the, this therapy process. And so one thing is that when I start adjustment, I don't push at all. I only touch the person. So right. I put my hand. I put my hand on the body, but I'm, I'm not pushing. Mm. So, so like wait that the communication starts and the, the student feels that they're safe, mm. because this is so much about the mind, how the yeah, body, like mm-hmm. how the body is releasing and how it's how it starts to move. So when they're not afraid and they feel comfortable. Even without pushing them, the body starts to move. Mm, mm. Well, it's like because I'm touching and because the attention and because, of course, they want to move. They mm, want to mm. get into mm. the pose and deeper and deeper. Mm. So they start to move. And when they start to move, I start to follow that movement. It's like very gently support uh, the body in the pose. And then the student can decide when they want to stop the movement, when they want to stop the pose. So already a long time ago, I stopped counting five in the adjustment. So we we move as far as it feels like uh, right. comfortable and very there's a limit. Yeah, you might stay with them a lot more breath. It can be eight, it can be 15 or 20 right. or sometimes even longer. Like... For example, if you give adjustment in Badha Konasana, if you follow the five counting 
And many times you, you get to some point but there would be so much left. Right. So much yeah. more space. So I don't want to stop after five because, you know, so if you keep eight or if you keep 10, you, the, the, the body goes so much deeper. And there's also more time to relax and also for the student time to feel safe and, and kind of relax the body and move deeper. So do you, is there any cause in your mind to put people into positions? As in to, you know, to exert more force, to make, you know, to, I mean, there's this idea that I don't necessarily subscribe to of, you know, well, they, well if you can put them into the position, then they will feel that shape and their body will remember that shape. And, you know, as you well know, but I'll be joyful, was kind of like, it was a kind of a make or break yeah. situation where you'd either break or, or it would make you, the opening would be, you know, it was always talking the early days about openings, right? Like, yeah, yeah. What, what, it doesn't sound like you're talking like that when you talk about adjustment. Um, I think it's maybe Supta Kurmasana is still the pose where you kind of a little bit forced to cross the feet. Okay. Right. Like more than in other poses. Might be Karanavasana. If the person cannot do the lotus pose, then you kind of a little bit forcing, but has to be very gentle. It's not your yeah, body. Yeah, so. that, yeah that's not really you, pushing someone really. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to give a wrong idea about yoga mm. because if, if you want to reach the higher states of the mind, it's uh, it won't come through the fear and pain. It it has to come through the you know relaxation and uh, feeling good. Yeah, feeling I, feeling yeah. ready. Feeling ready to move deeper. I feel that's maybe a slight rebalancing of the perspective that maybe was introduced in the you know in the early years that you know there was this idea no pain no gain you know the more you push the more you got you know kind of in an old Christian kind of penance if you if you suffered enough then you would get the goods right but, yeah um, I, we I think to, we're we have to remember how that, yeah. Yeah, we have to remember how Patavichers learned the adjustments from Krishna Charya. Um uh, didn't talk so much about the Krishna Charya, but we can we can hear from Iyengar's interviews that it was quite harsh. And also from this um, biography about Iyengar that he was almost committing suicide in the 1930s because he was treated so badly uh, by uh, Krishna Charya. So it was, it was very, very close. He was already going to this bridge and he, he was already going to jump down. Uh, so it, was, it went so far, the, hmm. the violence. And we can see how Iyengar was teaching. He was also violent, but the church mm. was also violent. Mm. And so they were all traumatized and uh, and the way how they were teaching was not as bad as what they received, but it was quite bad. It was quite bad, like how Iron guys throwing things around and shouting and slapping and yeah, it used to be called yeah. band kick slap a yenga. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I and also the, how, how, how the majority was yeah, pushing, there's a lot of pushing people and injuring so many, so many that... Along with... Well, it was, the, it was the way... Trauma. It was the way how they, how they learned. Yeah, yeah. How they could different. be different. Uh, the same way we... Cultural context. Yeah, exactly. And okay. the way how we learned was the same in the 90s. Mm. What I learned from my teachers and what I learned from Lino and all, I, I was also pushing people really hard and injuring many people. Right. Before uh, I started to change the, the way. And it was also time to change the way. Also, Sarat was changing. Even Pata Bichors was changing. So that kind of not pushing and injuring people uh, started already about 20 years ago. Mm. It's been going forward and forward. And I think be, when people nowadays get injured, the is mostly back pains because uh, yeah. 
the back are, back bends are still like a couple thousand and yeah, and there's still the encouragement of catching. There's a there's a yeah, yeah exactly yeah, catching yeah, is yeah. It's still yeah, yeah. I I would say it's way too hard. You know, I mean to give that feeling for people that they are not they're nothing if you don't catch catch them. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. He is is, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is is pretty uh, heavy for people and people has lots of trauma from that. I think it's just a standard, isn't it? A standard of uh, sometimes the standard of the teacher. If they can make you catch a standard of a student as a kind of final kind of a benchmark if you can catch. Um, and it's a, it's a sad standard to have been set up in a way, right? But I always thought it's a place where everyone, it's an obvious place where everyone can get a touch from, you know, from the teacher, from Sharat, or maybe not even from Sharat these days, but, you know, it used to be that he would do it with everyone and everyone would at least have that with him. So, you know, there's an obvious, I kind of felt it was an obvious place where they could get in with you for something, you know, and everyone did it and, you know, yeah. Anyway, so um, it's quite horrible so, to yeah. It's quite horrible to have a stiff back in Ostanga, especially in Mysore, because you you like yeah. a little bit kind of lower lower class people person. <laughs> <laughs> You're not part of that super yogis who can do a couple of thousand easily. Well, um, just kind of a, like a side going back before to your, your way you've changed as a teacher. What what for you makes a, a good teacher? What qualities should one look out for in a good teacher? What are we trying to teach exactly? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the the therapeutic perspective is 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 needed. Not so much like a teacher working as a teacher, some kind of coach, but working as a therapist, and that that takes out already so much the ego what so many teachers has. Uh, kind of working kind of the humble uh, therapist who wants to help people, who wants to have like a teamwork, how, try to find the best ways how we can make the progress and the ways for also like seeing the age, different body types, different options, uh, to make people to feel comfortable with Ashtanga. Because I think many, many people quit Ashtanga because it's they feel there is no progress, they get stuck in some Marichasana, C or D, the mm. teacher doesn't give the new poses. Uh, they feel maybe that they are not good enough. If they don't practice six times a week, it's not good. And all these things, we have to see that people come from different backgrounds, they have different responsibilities in the life. Some people can only practice once a week. So we have to see the person and, and you know, really work with that. Uh, what people can do, what is good mm. for them. And I think this is, this is the way how Chris Material also developed the practice when he started to move from Mysore to yeah. so Chennai. Kind of, yeah, yeah. It became more it like a... Therapy kind of it evolves with the person rather than like a template yeah. to kind of crush people into, right? Exactly. What, I mean, what's how how have you seen your practice evolve, and what what kind of I mean, do you practice every day still? Are you, and and are you doing the same thing that you were before, or have you amended it and evolved? You know, um, as, um, as, you've, as you've gotten older. Yeah, so I, I just turned fifty three. Oh my god! <sighs> right. <laughs> You're not doing yeah. that, then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I can I can feel a few things would happen. Uh, well, the one is that I've been injuring myself not only with yoga but with other things also. Uh, 2005, I had a surfing accident that I injured my neck, and I still feel it. But with the age my body became slower. And I don't know if you've seen Richard, Richard Freeman's new book, The Vinyasa. No, I haven't seen that yet. Okay. So in that book, Richard Freeman put the different sequences together. Like there is right. a forward bend sequence and then there is a twisting sequence and then there's a backward sequence. And, okay. 
And already before I saw the book, I could see that that is more natural for me. So going from back bend to the forward bend and forward to the back bend mm. is not comfortable anymore. Uh, even to do side salutation, to do that Urpa Mukha Svanasana, go to Adho Mukha Svanasana, is, is not so comfortable anymore. So my body became slower. So when I do the back bend and when I go to the forward bend, I might do like little child pose before, between or, or something else. Or I give a little bit more time for the back bend after the forward bend. Or, you know, this way I be changing the, the sequence that I do more forward bends and that's my sequence. So I do forward bends and it can be some acrobatic poses uh, from the second series, from the third series. And then I go to the second series back bends, following, you know, all the way to the bridge and, and going maybe uh, even to the third series um, back bend poses. And, you know, that kind of... Right, it's been okay. It's been changing, right? It's, it's really interesting. I, I, I love it. <laughs> That's interesting. So you're kind of creating your own vinyasa sequence using parts of the sequence Yes. Uh, sections of yeah, because they do cut and ch- cut is a kind of cut and paste, isn't it? You have a series yeah. of this and there's like a bit of a that, you know, like the and leading already, up to the you have a whole bunch of back bends and yes. So like uh, even the poses after Kapotasana, there is a few poses between, but still it feels like it's not enough before the Ekaparasirsasana and Viparasirsasana. There's a lot of pressure in the lower back. Right. Uh, especially when you start to be a little bit older. I'm not very old, I know. Like yeah. Somebody said, would say like, okay, you are not old. People are 70 or 80 and they practice yeah. Ashtanga, but uh, I can feel it. I can feel that I need more time. I, I need some poses between. Um, and, and even yeah. I suggest some people after the couple of dozen that they do the pigeon pose, to release the stress from the from the lower back, and it works quite well. Like before and the asana, there is a, there is the pitch and pose. So do you teach this in your regular master class as well, along with the students that can do the original sequence? Maybe they're younger and more able, right? And the older te- students, would you teach them your se- You know your your no, you just keep not, it not yet. Still. Not yet. <laughs> right. Okay. You're not ready. Right. Okay. Still a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, yeah, it's, my, cool, it's, my, it's my secret. Right, right. But no more, no more secret. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, um, I just want to wrap it up with you. It's been amazing to talk to you. Um, but um, I was to ask you what you mean by, and when you say in your biography, that you're a spiritual atheist. Um, how does that look in terms of... Uh, the postures and the Ashtanga sequence the, in the physical way that you've, you you know, come to do so many years. How does it, uh, you know, what what does the, what is the mentality behind it now? Do, have you got, you know, kind of into the philosophy, the yoga philosophy, or uh, would you say that you're religious with it at all? How, you know. Um, I'm reading the philosophy all the time. Right. I almost every day I study, but I really believe more for the experience than the studies. Of course, I get the information, the knowledge comes from the studies, the knowledge also comes from the, of course, from the teachers. And from the studies, but I, I really try to put more effort for the for my own experience. And like when I'm teaching in the workshops and retreats, it's not so much about the yoga philosophy. It's more about my own experience about yoga. Uh, from the beginning, I'm not very religious person, but definitely I would say that I'm a spiritual person. Because yeah, that's why I was intrigued. I, by your bio, you said spiritual atheist. 
And I can't yeah. The term. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I can feel the spirit. I can feel the connection. Right. But I don't really know about any gods. I think gods are part of the mythology any more than reality. Um, but the energy is everywhere. Energy is moving. Energy is in the thoughts, um, prayers. Whatever we do, there's always energy moving. Um, so I, I understand completely why people do rituals, puchas, everything, because there's a, it really, but I, I, I really, I'm more into the pranayama also nowadays. Um, Are you doing that right? You're doing that as well? Yeah. yeah. Pranayama, okay. daily pranayama. Right. And, and I've been studying with A.G. Mohan. Right. And that also uh, seems to be a kind of uh, a common thread with older teachers. Over time, they seem to kind of get naturally gravitate towards the project. Sure, we, you know, we want... It seems, yeah, yeah. Seems yeah we want more, we want more yeah, knowledge yeah. and understanding, especially yeah. the old Chris Macharius, uh knowledge, because Patabit Church was not always so open with... Or he, he had a different kind of approach. Um, so I'm... I'm of course, very interested about the, how Krishna was teaching and what he was teaching. Um, and pranayama seems to be very, very important for, for him. Actually, the, the way to, to really experience samadhi is, is that breath, not so much the asana, but the breath. And he's been also suggesting the there are like a short meditations between the different uh, pranayama techniques. So if you do ujjayi uh, for 10 minutes or some rounds, then there's a meditation or like being in that space, in that space of pranayama, in that kind of quiet, peaceful, empty space and really going into that, that quietness and some kind of holiness. And then you do the next uh, technique, maybe not a short enough. And again, after that, you have this five minutes being in that space, like really going, experiencing that benefits of the, of the prana. Mm. And that has been, but I still, I really love uh, Ashtanga and Asana and the whole system, I think it's it's the most amazing. <laughs> and I can I can see how the people practice and how if you find a way that they are happy and comfortable with the practice, it, it really opens everything. But the, uh, there has been issues now with the Ashtanga community that many people feel like uncomfortable from the sexual abuse from part of the choice from what Sarat has been doing, like kicking out students and teachers and, uh, you know, be having this mono, monopoly, mm. not, allow, not allowing all teachers to do teacher trainings or not to give me responsibilities. And there's a lot of confusion, but I can see, I, I, I've been also trying to somehow be honest and talk about this, Issue right. mm. in the community and to to free people from that pain. I mean, uh, what happened with Pata Bichoris and the sexual abuse? I don't think uh, the thing is solved yet. So I, I don't think the healing happened. What's supposed to happen? And partly it didn't happen because the whole conversation was made in the social media, which is completely wrong place to to discuss about anything. So there was mostly just the anger came out, but there was no healing happening. And the healing is still hasn't happened. And still there's quieting and not talking and not allowed to ask questions. And so in the workshops and retreats, I've been trying to talk and open that discussion. Also I understand where Ashtanga comes and what is the culture what kind of abuse Pata choice went through and the violence, 
why he left from home when he was 17 without telling to his parents that he went to Mysore, that he was really escaping from home. So there's lots of trauma in, uh, mm, mm. in the past, and, and there's also trauma now in, in our community, mm. which doesn't seem to be solved before, you know, there's more open communication. That's right. Well, yes, yeah, so nice, I think that's a nice way to end that. Uh, a very poignant <laughs> last, uh, <laughs> last piece. Well, maybe let's just give it, let's just give it um, uh, an idea of, of, of Petri outside the Ashtanga. What else, what else do you like to do outside yoga? Uh, do you have any other pastimes? I always say guilty pleasure, but, um, uh, you know, people don't like that so much. You know, the indulgences, you know, like, you like you know, music. Do you like music? Skateboarding? I know those things that you... Um, I think the... Well, I'm a family man. Um, we have two kids, three and six. I have also older son, 22. Um, I think that's that's about... I want to be with them. Right. Takes up all your time. Hang out and and um, be yeah. close, be a father. Right. Um, I don't have so much uh, kind of other desires right now. Maybe um, we bought a piece of land from Portugal. I want to start some agriculture project. And put my hands to the to the soil, <laughs> plant few Sounds trees. And, yeah, um, I'll join you and, there. Uh, yeah, maybe moving out from the big city and right start to live uh, more peacefully. It's going to be a bit hot for you if you're coming from Helsinki. You need yeah. to get that sun get that sun cream on. <laughs> <laughs> Going even right. to the more peaceful place. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Petri. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.